Welcome, everybody. And thank you for coming back for the last leg of a fairly marathon learning session in day three of the Mental Wellness and Substance Use, uh, sorry, the Mental Wellness Summit, part two. Um, as you can see, we have uh, some panelists coming to our stage. I'm, I'm going to do a bit just of a, a, a preamble on the, what we're going to see today, and then I'll introduce our next, sort of our last formal speakers. Um, I did sort of want to start because I think um, the way the day works, we're going we're gonna to be able to sit here and listen to this wonderful discussion, and then we're going to be able to probably move around a little bit. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and get some thank yous uh, and put them out now because uh, this was quite an amazing event over the last three days. Um, and there's been a lot of people involved in it, and I don't want to forget that opportunity. So first of all, thank you to everybody for coming, and thank you to everybody who stuck around for day three, which is phenomenal. Um, uh, as you know, this was put on, this is a partnership with the Council of Yukon First Nations and the uh, Government of Yukon. I do want to thank Grand Chief Johnson um, and Minister McPhee for opening this and also for supporting a lot of the work that went into not only putting this on, um, I, think, I, I think not only from opening remarks um, from Grand Chief uh, Johnson and Minister McPhee, but also from a lot of the presentations, there's sort of been, a, uh, there, there's a lot of theme around um, around community, around collaboration, around compassion, but also around urgency. And I think there is a sense of urgency to what we're talking about. Although um, many of these presentations were presentations of what's happening perhaps in other places or, or here in uh, a current form, I still think there's a sense of urgency as to how we translate this and how we um, uh, connect together to either remove barriers to programming that exists or look at uh, additions to programming, or I think we've seen um, radical shifts to how we approach um, people who request help or, or seek some of the services that uh, many of the people in this room are able to provide. Um, I would like to thank uh, Council of Yukon First Nations, in um, particular Alexis Anderson was very, very a great partner in helping to put this together, um, in, in helping us uh, really uh, identify speakers that fit uh, with, uh, with what we, we kind of wanted to, to learn from. Um, Candice Gottschall, who's in the back, Candice is responsible for so many things, but the lovely booklets in front of you are just one of the, 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 the organization, everything that's gone on here, the, the fact that, I mean, for those of you who remember Wednesday, which seemed like a long time ago, there was n nine different presentations in three hours. Thank you, Candace. <laughs> Jeff and Mike from Upstream, who are over here controlling mics and various things. Thank you. This was, uh, and, and, and thank you to uh, not only making this available to a virtual crowd who is watching right now, but to many of you who might go and tell your friends, your coworkers, your partners, that they should go online and check out some of these. These will be online, I'm going to say in perpetuity. Maybe there's an end date, I'm not sure. But you can go, you can watch the, uh, the, the presentations from the first summit, still, <clears throat> and you'll be able to watch these ones as well. So thank you. Um, I work with a team at Mental Wellness and Substance Use Services. Uh, there are many here today, um, and there are many to thank there. Um, Emma Eaton, who's here, I don't think there's much of any presenter, presenter who presented who didn't have a conversation with Emma prior. So thank you, Emma. Emma put a lot of this together as well. Um, and We'll talk about a trade show booth, but we have some other people in the trade show booth as well. There's been a lot of individuals from communications departments and tech departments and those things with the government of Yukon, so um, thank you to them. It's the end of my list. Thank you all. Did I already do that? <laughs> um, and of course, thank you to the presenters. Many presenters aren't here to hear that thank you. I, I hope they felt like they, our gratitude was there when, uh, as soon as they'd finished speaking and we had that opportunity, but um, thank you. Some have come a long way. Some have put in a lot of miles while they've been here. Um, we, uh, presenters who have come here have covered from Dawson City to Carcross to Teslin. Um, after uh, the presentation on Wednesday, they met Yvonne Jack and are going out to 
her land-based healing camp to get that experience as well. Not only are they getting that experience, they're getting that experience with a group of youth who are going out to that camp at the same time. They're doing it together. Um, and uh, up to Quinlan Dunn. So thank you for, for those presenters as well. So thank you to presenters past and present. Um, I'm going to introduce to you, we're, we're going to have a justice uh, framework. It's, it's a panel justice discussion. Um, and it's really innovations, kind of highlighting innovations, but also gaps. I'm going to stay in the justice system, but that's a bit limiting because we're talking about health systems. And to talk about a justice system without talking about a health system is probably not the way to approach it. Um, in fact, that was said very clearly yesterday by one of my, one of my, one of the <laughs> presenters. Um, that uh, you can't look at somebody, and in particular they said a Maori man in a prison cell, without looking at the context behind it. And that context can be uh, a health system as well. So we have, and as I say your names, just you can raise your hand so that everybody knows, but we have Gigi McKee, who is the Assistant Regional Director at Connective. Um, uh, we have Lindsay Ellis, Officer in Charge of Whitehorse Detachment. Aaron Linklater, Manager of the Restorative Justice and Community Safety Program for the Kwanlin Dunn First Nation. We don't have Elias Park. <laughs> and we have Bronte, Renwick Shields, um, with uh, Blood Ties Four Directions. So um, before I introduce this uh, topic, uh, I just want to acknowledge we are having this very important discussion on the traditional territories of the Kwanlin Dunn First Nation and the Tan Quichon Council, um, as well as the um, summit. Now, um, after this, I'm going to come back up here and have one more important thing to say around a trade show that's happening just across the hall. If you do uh, have to use the washroom during this uh, discussion and want to go take a look, you can. But essentially, there are a lot of services being offered over there, and I'll come and outline that uh, just after this. Um, so substance use, including alcohol, mental health concerns, and activities peripheral to substance use, you know, these can be property crime, sex work, trafficking for the, person of, for the purpose of facilitating substance use, use all contribute to people who have interacted with the justice system for health reasons becoming criminalized. Once on this path, we see that outcomes may be less than ideal from a variety of standpoints for the individual and the community. So we are gathered here today to both highlight the good practice that has been effective within the Yukon, as well as come together and let people know about gaps that continue to exist in these systems. So for better or worse, I'm going to be your moderator for this sort of panel, and we're going to do it in a question and answer type uh, format. So. Um, I'm going to let you folks decide who wants to go first. I haven't, not sure how you're going to decide that, but go ahead. <laughs> so the first question, can you tell us about what your organization does and how you've changed your services in the past five or so years to meet sort of this need or awareness of the overlap between the legal system and healthcare needs? I'll choose if you want me to choose. They've already appointed me. Okay. <laughs> With their heads. <laughs> Do I have to talk closer to this? Oh, yeah. Good morning. Um, I'm Gigi. Um, like Cameron mentioned, I'm the Assistant Director for Yukon Services. So I work for Connective Support Society. Um, we are a, an organization that serves uh, individuals with complex barriers um, or experiencing complex barriers across BC and uh, fairly recently into uh, Whitehorse Yukon Territory um, just about two and a half years ago. Um, we're a person-centered uh, organization that meets the needs of each individual that we're serving as well as the, the community needs. So every community has different uh, types of programming. So it could be employment, it could be housing, it could be supported housing, um, advocacy. Um, yeah, we have over 55 programs across BC and the Yukon, and uh, we have over 600 uh, housing units, whether they're supported 24-7 um, or with minimal supports. Um, and then I guess to answer sort of what we've done over the last five years, we've only been up here for just about two and a half years. Um, we um, responded to uh, an urgent need for what some of you guys would have known as the uh, ARC, where the Salvation Army was uh, supporting adult uh, men involved with the justice system. Um, the contract was no longer uh, valid and we were reached out uh, and had a couple of weeks to get the uh, 
current program, so the Supervised Housing and Reintegration Program, uh, which we call SHARP, which is located in an old unit of the Whitehorse Correction Centre. Um, so that is a program that still provides supports for adult men within the justice system, and we provide up to 20 beds um, with uh, gents that are either um, involved with a bail, probation, or parole. Um, and navigating the healthcare system is, uh, like Cameron mentioned, they're all intertwined. Um, so we work with every individual that's there, in, uh, person-centered as to what their needs may be. It could be as simple as just even navigating the, the system itself to get you know, healthcare documents, some people are not from here, some people are from other territories or provinces, and so navigating the systems is, is really difficult, especially if you are experiencing complex barriers um, or have, um, yeah, just, I mean, it's hard enough for us um, or myself not experiencing um, barriers at this time to, to get any kind of documentation. So um, doing things in the right order um, and then also focusing on what their needs are uh, individually. So the physical, mental, emotional um, and spiritual well-being and ensuring that we're, we're um, going in the direction that each individual is, is choosing and um, uh, making sure that they are getting the tools and supports that they need to be able to cope um, uh, with, um, with, with life um, and uh, when they are reintegrating either into the community or into market rent after they, after they transition and to uh, provide the continuum of supports uh, once they leave our program and into another or into another home. Lindsay. <laughs> Thank you very much, Gigi. Uh, I'm Lindsay Ellis. Uh, today, I'm very, very grateful to be here uh, on behalf of Whitehorse Attachment, but also the Yukon RCMP. Uh, very uh, broad question and very wide uh, range of topic, and I'm very happy to be here with the other panelists. Uh, we work together um, both in just relations, but also just at times in partnerships. So thank you very much for having us here, or having me here. Um, so the RCMP, I'm sure everybody's aware of what the RCMP does here in the Yukon. Uh, we have been here uh, for over 125 years providing police service. Uh, within the 125 years, there has been vast change in what that police service looks like, uh, just as society evolves and changes. Um, I think that uh, really not within the last five years, but more within the last 10 years, um, there has been a huge shift and a huge intention change of how we provide police service and how we connect and have relationships with the community. Uh, most people who are Yukoners are well aware of the sharing common ground and the review of the Yukon RCMP's police force or police service uh, that was 2020, 2010 to about 2012. And the implementation of the recommendations really, really shifted our focus back to community and also cultural relevance. Um, and that's seen throughout the territory now in our detachments uh, and even here in Whitehorse. Uh, a huge uh, change uh, for us was the uh, how we how we responded to and addressed uh, acute intoxication, and so one of the recommendations was to have. Um, uh, folks who are acutely intoxicated where there's no other place to go and as a last resort to not be lodged with the RCMP and Whitehorse in our cell block, but to be lodged um, with the arrest and processing unit, uh, which is a government of Yukon minister, uh, justice um, facility. And that was to provide more effective care um, because we did fail someone. We failed Raymond Silver Fox. And that has been a real change in how we're seeing um, or, or how we've uh, addressed, um, you know, substance use and acute intoxication. So that's sort of the, the marker there. Within the last five years, um, because of the changes uh, within the healthcare system and just within society, uh, we've had to be a lot more nimble and responsive both in Whitehorse and in the communities to how um, we respond to calls for service but also uh, individuals and communities in crisis and in need. 
a few of those uh, shifts and changes, you know, have uh, also come with the opioid crisis. And so in 2016, the opioid crisis started here in the Yukon, um, and it progressively has, has had us have uh, some action points and some change that, that we needed to do uh, in order to serve Yukoners and, and serve people where they are. Uh, a few of those uh, changes that were that were done quite quickly. Uh, so when the supervised consumption site was uh, was uh, started here and opened up here in Whitehorse, uh, we'd never had that here before in the territory or that level of service for people. And so the RCMP, uh, in um, discussion with uh, mental wellness and substance use services, with Blood Ties for Directions, uh, us getting informed on how we could help and encourage people to utilize that facility. We changed our operational posture around that facility to, uh, you know, not to target anybody who would be coming in uh, to to ensure that that we were encouraging people to use that, knowing full well that we couldn't arrest our way out of an addiction, um, and and that goes also for you know uh, all substance use, so uh, alcohol um, and and opioids. Um, the other thing that has, you know, really shifted within the last five years in the territory, and it's territory-wide, is, you know, and I touched on a little bit with the arrest and processing unit, uh, but the posture around uh, arrest of acutely intoxicated individuals. Um, that arrest and that incarceration is a last resort. Uh, even in the communities, um, members of the RCMP have community connections, and they're trying to find a safe location for people because we do understand and we acknowledge the overrepresentation, especially of Indigenous people, in the um, correctional system, and correctional or even just a secure system. So uh, that continues, and that that's a real shift in the last five years. Um, I think that you know most of our calls for service are rooted in health. Most of our calls for service are rooted in gaps around health, which then result in you know poverty, homelessness, uh, and and um, you know disturbance type type incidents. Um, I, I don't think it's a surprise to anybody that liquor is probably our number one, or alcohol is our number one substance that causes interaction with the police. Um, that is territory-wide. But what we've done to try and ensure that the folks are cared for and that there's safety and security for individuals and communities is really important. Um, I'm going to shift a little bit just into just some really quick highlights of what we've done around sort of mental health and how in five years we've really changed. So uh, over the last year and a half, we've developed a really wonderful partnership, and I'll call it a partnership, with mental wellness and substance use services here in town. Um, just trying to be a little bit more uh, prevention-based and responsive-based to individuals who are frequently interacting with the police for emotional disturbance or mental health crisis. Uh, we've had a few uh, success stories where um, our members can pick up the phone, call uh, one of the managers over at Mental Wellness, and say, you know, we have this individual. We've done six well-being checks with this individual over the last month. They're really not well. Um, we're taking them to hospital, but maybe the assessment there is not maybe giving them what they need. Um, can you help? And we're able to make that referral, and then we're able to work together to figure out what the healthcare needs are, and ensure that you know the police aren't overly interacting with this person in the future. That potentially some you know uh, violence or some um, unsafe situations are avoided for that person, both as potential you know criminal behavior and or as a victim. Um, and we've got several success stories about that, and one of those is uh, we had an individual who had 68 uh, dealings with us here in Whitehorse over the last two years. That's excessive, all for emotional disturbance. Um, we've connected in with mental wellness. That person is being connected in with the health care system, and we've had zero calls for service with that individual. So that, that tells me that that person's being served where they need to be served, which is within health care. Uh, another really, um, you know, exciting thing that we've done 
um, is the establishment, can I talk about this, Cameron, yet? Oh. Do you know where I'm going with this? Okay. <laughs> You're going to pretend you know where I'm going with this, but yeah. I'm, I'm a moderator, not a employee at the moment. Okay, perfect. Uh, we're really excited about this, but over the last two years, uh, we've been working with uh, Health and Social Services, uh, Yukon government, to establish a mobile crisis response team. And so that pairs a clinician, it pairs a nurse with an RCMP member. And that team of two to start, we're hoping to expand, and we're also hoping to expand out of the White Horse area after this pilot is done. Um, it is to provide improved outcomes to individuals who are suffering from mental health crisis and to also prevent maybe that interaction with, the, with law enforcement and with police services and with corrections. Um, and divert hopefully away from the emergency department at Whitehorse General Hospital where um, that is for acute, you know, acute need. But if there's a way that we can you know, ensure that that person's needs are being met in healthcare, then we'll do it. Um, we've already test run it a couple of times and it's been highly successful. We had um, our member who's been identified, Joel Talbot, go out into the exhibition area. He's there with Brent Edwards. Um, he's our assigned member. We're going to be getting started soon. We had him paired up with a psychiatrist. They went out and they did a home visit. It's been forever, I think, that, that I've seen a home visit of a clinician with a police officer to go and meet somebody where they were at. And um, it was highly effective. Our presence was required for some safety pieces, but also our presence was was actually a positive. Um, so um, that was an excellent test run. I think that we're all excited for this to go ahead. And um, yeah, it's we're, we're definitely becoming a lot more nimble in trying to respond to just the capacity issues that are in healthcare that are being placed upon, I think, many first responder agencies. And I'll speak uh, not only on behalf of the RCMP, but also our um, UConn EMS partners. I think that uh, that they're also seeing that as well. And so uh, we're trying to be a, a lot more responsive in the last five years. And um, with that, I will turn it over to Bronte. Thanks, Lindsay. Hi, everyone. Thanks so much for having me here with you today. Um, my name is Bronte, as Cameron introduced, and um, I'm the executive director for Blood Ties, and I'm really grateful to be here speaking on behalf of Blood Ties for Direction Centre today. Um, if you're not familiar with us, Blood Ties is a health, housing, and harm reduction organization that's operated in Whitehorse. We also provide uh, education services um, all throughout the Yukon. Uh, we've been around since 1993. Um, we started off in our roots as an HIV and AIDS organization um, back in the 90s, and from there have grown to support folks that um, use substances on a, on a broader scale, so people who use drugs. Um, we also provide services to people who are experiencing homelessness and who may be experiencing barriers for, uh, to health and housing and wellness for a variety of reasons. Um, this includes people who are incarcerated and many of the folks we work with um, have experience with the justice system or are currently involved with the justice system. Uh, some of the uh, supports that we provide are we have a drop-in center in Whitehorse, uh, we provide housing support, prevention, um, sexually transmitted and bloodborne infection uh, education, sexual health education, um, overdose response uh, education and naloxone training, and uh, harm reduction supports and supplies. We also are the operating partner in collaboration with Kwanlin Dunn First Nation and Fetal Alcohol Syndrome Society Yukon on the mobile outreach van in Whitehorse. And we currently operate the supervised consumption site in Whitehorse. Um, so many of our services um, and the clients that we work with directly operate within a system that criminalizes a lot of the supports and a lot of the activities that people are engaged in. And so most notably where we see our interaction with the justice system is in ways that substance use currently is criminalized and ways in which we've had to um, be innovative and navigate that system in order pr to provide supports to people who experience stigma, discrimination, and criminalization because of a, what is a health issue. Um, and you know, in some of those ways that are most notable, uh, in 2018 we applied for the first um, drug checking exemption in the Yukon. Uh, this was in order to be able to check people's drugs without fear of um, criminalization uh, when they were bringing their substance in to be tested for fentanyl. Um, and 
prior to that, that wasn't an activity that someone could engage in legally anywhere in the territory. Uh, in order to do that, we had to do an extensive application with Health Canada um, in order to just, you know, be able to provide someone with that health service in order to check their drugs. Um, and that's still something we have to do when we're looking to check drugs somewhere. So um, every time we want to check drugs in a location, we have to apply for an exemption, uh, try to get around the criminalization of substances. And the same goes for the supervised consumption site. That's a place that's exempted uh, from this system. And so what we're really seeing is that what we're trying to do is fill gaps in a system that is criminalizing people for a, a health issue. Um, and we're repeatedly trying to, uh, to fill those gaps in ways that are innovative but that aren't really addressing the root cause, which is that substance use is criminalized in our community and that leads to a lot of harm. Um, we, it leads to people who do not access our life-saving services, such as the supervised consumption site, such as drug checking, safe supplies, uh, education, because they fear criminalization. You know, even though that wouldn't happen in our space, when something is criminal, when something is illegal, and you know that an activity you're engaging in, that comes with such a weight and such a stigma in your community, even if you aren't actually engaged in the justice system currently, and such a fear that the repercussions of what might happen if you were to be incarcerated, if, if you were to, to face um, charges for what you're doing. There's a lot of people who aren't going to access services and, and that's, that's where we see a lot of harm. Um, we also see that people, most notably where that comes to, um, the most devastating front is when people aren't calling 911 for fear of criminalization in the, in the effect of an overdose. So those are some of the, the areas that we work to to try to navigate around the justice system. We provide supports directly to people who are engaged in the justice system as well, making release plans with people who are incarcerated, working with people who are currently incarcerated, attending court visits with folks. But most notably what we see is the ways in which this system isn't working when it comes to how we deal with substance use and the gaps that we have to fill where we're still missing uh, you know, key moments where we could have intervened, how we dealt with this as a health issue and not a criminal one. Um, and the ways in which that limits the abilities for us to be responsive and reactive to the overdose crisis. So when we have to apply for a drug checking exemption every time we move locations, that means we can't come and drug checks your drug check anywhere in a community. We can't just, you know, when we get requests, you know, can you just come and provide drug checking services in this space? We can't do that because we need to apply for an exemption each time. And that limits our ability to be responsive and reflective of community needs. So these are ways in which um, we're currently kind of navigating within this justice system in which we've adapted since 2016 in particular to try to meet the needs, but also ways in which we need to move forward as a, as a community so that we're not, like, most first and foremostly, Blood Ties strongly believes that substance use shouldn't be a part of the justice system, that this isn't something that is a justice issue and that, it, and that it should be decriminalized and acknowledging that substance use in its various forms and people who struggle with substances um, need, you know, may need health supports um, and, they need, and ultimately what they're doing is not a crime. Um, and so that's the root of where we're seeing engagement with the justice system and what we've seen in the past five years um, in terms of how that's impacted people in our community. I'm gonna pass it over to Erin. Good morning. My, good morning. My name is Erin Linklater. Um, I'm the manager of community safety and um, restorative justice at Quinlan Dunn First Nation. Uh, I'm a citizen of Vantuck Wichin, but was born and raised in Whitehorse. Um, and I just have a few notes here. So. Um, like Cameron said, um, context is very important. Um, so I just like to remind um, people where I come from working for a self-government, self-governing First Nation, um, the reality in Whitehorse and for the Kwanlandan people and for Yukon First Nations people as a whole is um, a history of colonization, many generations going to residential schools, um, like oppression in many ways, legislatively, um, through the dispossession of land, and that was um, the damage caused by that on individuals, the racism, the feelings of inadequacy um, are so deep, like it's so, it's so unquantifiable. And um, 
luckily, uh, some of our elders uh, in the 70s went to negotiate with Ottawa, um, negotiated self-government over the course of 20 years, and uh, a bunch of the First Nations here signed agreements. Um, now, um, we are working hard to implement those. And the philosophy behind that, the reasoning behind that, if you go read together today for our children tomorrow, is um, that Indigenous people need to have authority over their own lives, to have freedom, to be able to live in a way that uh, makes them feel um, like they matter, that they have self-esteem, that their way of life matters. And that's a challenge every day for Indigenous people. You're always um, meet, like coming up against these barriers. And it's still the case, even if we have self-government right now, it's difficult to um, create programming, create systems that work for us. Um, so I am now working in the justice field of a self-governing First Nation, but when the agreements were negotiated, um, justice was sort of left aside to be dealt with at a later time. So we now have to negotiate what is called an administration of justice agreement um, in order to get sort of fuller block funding to be able to think of ways to actually build our um, First Nations uh, ability to respond to justice issues um, in a way that makes sense for the citizens of the community. So right now, if you go to court in Whitehorse, um, it is pretty much all non-First Nations people um, behind the bench, behind the bar. And, and people going through the system are majority, like mostly Indigenous people. And it's no secret to us um, that health and well-being are connected to the justice system. Um, is very much a tool of oppression for many, many years, um, as is corrections, as was law enforcement. So um, right now, the state of over-incarceration of Indigenous people is no better. Um, it is still um, a huge issue. And it's therefore a huge issue for our communities. How do we um, have a safe community and feel well and feel safe enough to go and go to work and go to school? How do we feel spiritually well if we can't access the land, um, if we're poor, if we don't have housing? So these things are all very related. And as an employee at a First Nation, you're trying to think of ways to um, build a structure, build things for these people, but we're coming up against the negotiation table. Um, we're coming up against politics. We're coming up against a very entrenched criminal justice system. Um, so we're trying to be creative and innovative um, and in order to support citizens um, given this really difficult reality that we find ourselves in. So one thing that Kwanlin Dunn has done in the last five years is start the Community Safety Officer Program. So um, this was in response to the murder of Brandy Vitraqua, a young woman from my community, actually, Old Crow and Port McPherson. And um, yeah, she was killed in Kwanlin Dunn, in McIntyre, and people did not feel safe. There were a series of really serious crimes happening. Um, so the First Nation decided that they would start this safety officer program. They did an assessment. They did an environmental um, design. So they cleaned up the community, um, put in lights, um, and started this program where Indigenous um, people uh, are, act as a bit of a buffer between the police and the community. So. They've really, they patrol at night. Um, they have an, a cell phone that people can call and text. And they have built up this trust with the community members. So like Bronte was saying, like if you are experiencing an overdose or um, there's criminal activity going on, um, they feel a lot safer calling or texting the CSOs for help than they do the RCMP because um, the CSOs are there for support and to um, 
sort of liaise services. So they may call the RCMP if the RCMP are needed um, because the CSOs do not carry weapons. Um, there's sa safety issues there. They may call EMS, um, but it just has created this, um, this place that people can go when they don't feel safe calling those other services because of the history we have with them. And um, despite you know, the difficult history with the RCMP and indig indigenous peoples, we have come a long way also in the last five years with the RCMP through our tripartite agreement. So we have a, a letter that sets out our agreement. We have three officers that work in the office right next door to me. And they, you know, um, they came on a moose hunt with me two weeks ago with the kids in the town, and um, they've really done a lot to um, gain the trust of the community, and it does make a big difference. Um, also working with the staff at, um, in the Justice Department. So, yeah, back to the CSOs. Um, it has been very successful. Um, people do say they feel much safer in McIntyre. People have been moving back. Um, there's success stories every single day when I read their reports. Um, they have regulars, they um, respond to all kinds of calls, um, have really strong relationships with the youth in, in the community, and they're just so amazing and reliable. But from a manager's perspective, from my perspective, um, there's a lot that needs to be done with the CSO program. Um, it is difficult to, we still don't have, we still have to apply to, for funding year to year. Um, it is a very expensive program to run well. Um, burnout is an issue, working late hours. Um, we ask a lot of these young guys. Um, and uh, they're short staffed, we need more vehicles, we need uh, more cultural time on the land and um, to make it sustainable. And again, like, the way it started was um, the chief and the justice director at the time just saying, you know what, enough is enough, we're doing this with or without you, Yukon Government Canada. And then they um, decided to partner. Um, but it's difficult, it's always a fight um, to do things in a different way um, than the status quo. So. Yeah, and right now we're trying to work on other initiatives um, to uh, divert people away from the criminal justice system um, as much as possible to strengthen the community, to have it ready for reintegration, for programs on the land. We're building an on the land camp right now as we speak, and but there's just so far to go. And um, the administration of justice piece is a huge barrier for us. So thank you for that. I, um, so the second question, and I, I think you've actually all touched on this. Um, the second question was sort of around, can you tell us from your perspective uh, what some of the gaps are in connecting these systems? And I, I, I do think it's hard to answer probably any question about what your agency does in terms of health and justice without identifying some of those. Um, so don't feel you have to repeat yourself, but I wonder if I can add to that, uh, just to add a bit to this question. Um, I've never been a moderator before, and I'm feeling quite powerful at the moment. Like, I can change. <laughs> this is this, very important. Um, but you, you highlighted, I think, some of the gaps between maybe the systems connecting. And, and it doesn't have to be a system. It could be maybe government to government. Maybe it's government to community or community to community. But just in your responses, there's some gaps you've noticed from either your own agency's perspective or others in collaborating with the right folks or maybe even highlighting some of those and you don't have to but just the thought of the gaps that perhaps exist for people accessing the service while at the same time the gaps maybe for people who provide the service is it uh, have we run up against any gaps in really connecting our right with our right allies but totally unfair but just 
the wrench. <laughs> Um, I think I can speak to a little bit of that now that um, uh, hi. <laughs> now that we you've you've heard a little bit um, about some of the other organizations um, and I can speak a little bit more to some of the programs that we also provide here in Whitehorse um, and sort of the, the gaps that we've seen as an organization and the individuals that we serve. So I touched uh, about uh, Sharp, the supervised housing and reintegration program, um, but we also operate the um, Housing First. Um, uh, program on Fifth and Wood Street, which is a harm reduction program. Um, so we we work with blood ties very closely um, for for the drug testing and uh, information and um, just education on uh, safe safe use, safe consumption. Um, and then we also work very closely with uh, RCMP, um, just in meeting regularly with uh, some of the things that Lindsay talked about. Um, uh, just with sort of that case management piece with calls and things like that and if there's anything that we can s reduce recidivism or individuals um, being removed from the property um, and also to to help mediate um, and um, uh, like the, the fear that comes with uh, some of the things that may be happening um, within the building and we also have a another uh, program. There's two under there, which is, serves two individuals that are under the Yukon Review Board. Um, so these are individuals that were out of the territory because there was no housing or programming available to them that returned to the territory. Um, so they have disposition orders uh, under the Review Board, um, which means that there were um, activities, criminal activities that had taken place, but um, uh, they were not deemed uh, criminally responsible, either through mental health or disability. Um, so we support those individuals. And some of the gaps that we see as an organization and having those, those four very different programs with very different approaches and eligibilities um, is sort of the continuum of support as they transfer through the continuum of housing or supports that they may need um, or reintegration. And, um, it doesn't mean that it's, it's not happening. Like we do continue to work very closely with all organizations within the community that um, these individuals are involved with. Um, but we do see uh, a gap with some of the, um, I guess when mostly with uh, SHARP where individuals are moving, they, they've got a very structured uh, program um, and then they're moving towards that reintegration piece and you know utilizing the tools and, and supports that they have gained um, and strategies to to move into sort of a market rent or, or other housing or the community um, but then we you know we've noticed that the the gap between that program or moving to unsupported housing is is huge huge on on their mental well-being their emotional well-being um, the supports that they need to be able to continue um, you know being successful in their own own ways um, and yeah, I guess that's just something that we've really, really noticed. Um, and not that there aren't supports being transferred, it's just more the transitional. Um, and yeah, I'm not sure if anyone else has anything. We're going in order again? <laughs> sure, Gigi. Thanks for starting on this question. <laughs> Uh, yeah, and uh, fully agree with with what you have just said and what my fellow panelists have talked about in the last question around gaps. Um, I think you know there's systemic gaps and there's um, you know systemic barriers um, for individuals, for communities, for our agencies. Um, I do see a lot of positive in the last few years about everybody coming to the table, not only from the community level but from the agency level, to try and make it work and make sense. Um, you know, the RCMP is a national organization, but here in the Yukon, because I think of just us being here in the Yukon, we've been able to be a lot more responsive and nimble and I don't want to say right on the coattails of sort of the, the Yukon progressive um, way, but we are leaders as a territory across the country, not the RCMP only, but, um, but just the Yukon uh, and Yukon First Nations with self-government, all of those things. And the Yukon RCMP has been really able to sort of 
you know, uh, leverage that and be a part of that and be, be nimble too. So that's, you know, not so much as a gap, but, you know, I've got a lot of examples of where we just make things make sense um, with our partners and with the other agencies um, and trying to reduce those barriers. Um, those barriers do exist, though. Um, you know, Gigi just touched on it really quickly around transitional housing, but also supportive housing. And, and we notice it a lot with the RCMP around, um, you know, we're getting there and other agencies are getting there with trying to tailor what the housing looks like for what the complex needs might be. And so, of course, while that transition and that growth and improvement is happening, um, we are noticing the bumps. It happens. Um, but through good relationships with the community and the individuals and also with the partner agencies, we're able to support that and support the growth that needs to happen. Um, one gap that that we notice is sort of that um, when when an individual has acute psychiatric need and how can they stay in community and be housed if those supports aren't there for them and so that is something that I think will continue to be addressed and Gigi spoke really well about that. Um, and we're also in this really interesting time and Bronte talked about you know um, decriminalization, safe supply. We're sort of in a time of transition where you know the RCMP. We know that if we don't continue to do the good work around organized crime enforcement, around that sort of higher level um, economic greed uh, that is taking place here in the Yukon and across Canada. If we let our foot off the gas with that, that's not going to bode well for the Yukon and Yukoners. So example, you know, we have a lot of strength here in the Yukon as Yukoners and Yukon First Nations, but there is some vulnerability as well. And so we're in this really, um, I don't want to call it awkward, it's not awkward, it's just a really interesting time because we're trying to support, um, you know, harm reduction, but we're also balancing that with uh, the requirement for, at times, law and order and structure um, because of organized crime and just how it works and and I could speak probably all day about that, about my thoughts around that and my background in, in that work. Um, so we're in a really, it, it's a fine balance right now. Um, I think that, you know, there's a lot of opportunities and knowing where to leverage those opportunities to get through the gaps in these times is really, really important. Um, I'll just look at my notes here because I think there's a few other things. Um, and I'm going to say this for the whole Yukon, it's not just for Whitehorse, but I touched on, you know, how w jail is a last resort for acutely intoxicated individuals, um, but especially out in the communities, depending on the capacity of the community uh, and depending on the capacity of potentially the First Nation in that community, um, we're really the only option. The RCMP are the most accessible, you know, 24-7 uh, option. And we recognize that that's not ideal. We're there to support those communities in building their capacity. Um, Tronda Quitchen uh, First Nation in Dawson City. Uh, our Dawson City detachment is working with their health department on getting a um, similar model going of what we're doing here in Whitehorse with uh, mental wellness and substance use services and what we've been doing with Kwanlin Dunn for at least five years uh, about having a health and a wellness worker, you know, really working with our members, maybe being able to attend a call with our members. So um, we're, we're here to support um, the capacity issues, the gaps, we're here to always support that, but ensuring that it's not done in a colonial way either. Um, and so I think that that is one of the awesome things about the Yukon is that that community led, that community drive, it's there and, um, and we're all just along to support that. Bronte. Uh, thanks. Lindsay, um, I think, you know, 
one of the things, I, I spoke a lot about gaps in my, <laughs> my intro, and I think as Cameron said, it's, it's kind of sometimes hard to talk about what supports you're offering without talking about those gaps, because a lot of our supports are there to try to fill those. Um, but I also, uh, speaking to collaboration between partners, want to acknowledge just how um, incredibly supportive of a community the Yukon is in terms of harm reduction and in terms of supports. And because we are a small um, northern community, when I speak to partners down south, a lot of the time the questions I get is like, how much pushback do you get in terms of things like supervised consumption or harm reduction supplies? And compared to a lot of other smaller communities, it's it's a lot less. And we have a lot more community support and a lot more, um, I think, Yukoners who who really deeply care about these topics and want to see change and want to see things like like safe supply and decriminalization come into our communities. And we that's that's really incredible to see. Um, we also have a lot of amazing community partners, like the folks that are sitting at this this table. Um, a, a, a good example of that is the Outreach Fan, which has been operating since um, 2001, which is a partnership between Colin and Dunn and uh, FASI and Blood Ties, um, and how we can work together to um, support people and, and fill those gaps. Um, but I, 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 of course, will get into what, what those gaps are. Um, so, I mean, Gigi and Lindsay spoke to a lot of this already, but I think um, and it, it, there's a, a variety of reasons, and we have to look at this from the point of context, which Aaron and Cameron spoke to about why someone might end up involved in the justice system. It's never as simple um, as just seeing someone who's criminalized. There's always these social systemic uh, factors that occurred in that person's life um, as a result of many of the things people have already spoken about in terms of colonization, in terms of um, mental health, in terms of substance use, in terms of uh, their life story that brought them there. And many of those factors involve going outside of the justice system and looking at our health and housing system as well. And one gap that we definitely see is um, supportive and transitional housing. So the Housing First building, uh, we do a lot of work with, and it's an incredible um, building and opportunity for, for folks who need that support in the Yukon. Uh, we definitely need more of it. Whenever uh, there's a call for you know, rooms um, in that building, we can think of a massive list of individuals who would greatly benefit from that level of support. Um, and we're always having to power that down. Uh, and what I see frequently, because we work with the by name list and we work with Safe at Home on housing individuals, uh, we have um, eight of our own uh, housing units, um, is just how frequently you know a private market rental comes up, but we know that someone's not necessarily going to be successful there without round-the-clock supports. And we, you have someone who is unhoused, who is struggling deeply because they are unhoused, and that often puts them in a place where they are criminalized or where they become part of the justice system, but you don't have housing that meets their needs, and so you private market housing will not be a solution for that individual, maybe in the future, but they need supportive housing to, to get that foot off the ground. And that supportive housing needs to include things like harm reduction, drug checking, um, ideally supervised consumption, opportunities to avoid things like overdoses occurring, um, and opportunities for people to engage in uh, mental health services, in, in uh, treatment services, in, in other supports. And I think We've, we've begun to see that in the Yukon with buildings like Housing First, um, and we, we need to see that increase because um, if people don't have somewhere safe to go at night, that, uh, that really, um, de really decreases their chances of success at other opportunities in their lives. Um, and what we're seeing uh, as someone who operates housing, we don't have 24 hour on the clock support. We have an emergency after hours phone, and we have daytime support for our housing. But it's much easier, and not that it's easy, but it, it can be easier to build housing than to uh, access funding to support that housing on an ongoing basis. So to be able to provide um, the staffing that we need um, for a variety of reasons, both the funding as well as accessing that staff. And th that's the kind of housing that we really deeply need. Um, acknowledging that housing as a spectrum in the Yukon is a challenge for, for everyone. Um, I think that what Gigi also spoke to, the reintegration from both corrections but also um, treatment, um, extended stays in uh, hospital, um, opportunities for people to not be released and have nowhere to go, um, but have somewhere safe to go to um, work on uh, whatever they've, they've been working on wherever they have been. So if they're in treatment, um, often going to the shelter is not uh, going to be conducive to their success when they leave um, and having opportunities like supportive transitional housing to support that individual in their goals. Um, and I think, you know, we, when we talk, you know, Cameron wanted to just talk a bit about worker 
um, what, what do we see as a worker in those gaps? And I think that comes down to, to what our, our capacity is to sometimes engage. Sometimes we're so busy trying to meet these gaps with an individual, we don't have time to reach out to our partners and say, hey, we need help, or what are you doing? Um, and so that's you know, building um, increased supports and increased staffing to, so that we can take time to attend uh, forums like this and have discussions and see what we're all doing, because we're all doing incredible things, but we often don't get enough time to talk about it together and, and build capacity together. Um, but I think, yeah, I mean, most notably when I think of justice and I think of substance use, I do think of the ways in which our drug policy has failed people who use drugs um, and ways in which we can work together as a community to, to address that issue. Um, and some of those things are um, addressing things like increased uh, access to safe supply because when um, Lindsay talks about things like, you know, uh, organized crime or um, the, the issues with the drug supply, that is a product of the fact that we have an unregulated supply of drugs. Mm -hmm. So um, violence, uh, crime, involvement with the, subs with, the, um, with the criminal justice system is because there is not a regulated supply that is accessible to people who use drugs, um, where they can access their drugs without um, having to go through a criminal system. Um, and so because of that, we see all these other societal factors, like the property crime that was talked about earlier, or um, violence, or and these are not because of substance use, but they're because of the way that that market is currently regulated. And it's not about the people who necessarily are selling drugs on the street level, because you get rid of, you, 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 you criminalize, you arrest one of those individuals, someone else is going to pop up to meet that need. Right now it's a market need, and until we provide an alternative, a safe, regulated alternative, where someone knows what substance they're going to get when they buy it, and they know that they're not going to be criminalized for accessing it, we're going to continue to see drugs being sold um, on an, in an illegal market. Um, and I think that that's, that's where we need to see like decriminalization and safe supply, and those things come together so that we're providing a safe alternative for individuals um, and so that we're not losing so many Yukoners every year to overdose, um, as well as providing you know, options for people who want to change their substance use or want to, want to stop uh, using substance for now. But it is really integral that we, we talk about safe supply and safe supply that really meets those people's needs if we're talking about how do we bring this out of the justice system um, because it's, it's the drug policy, not necessarily the drugs, uh, that result in um, a lot of the outcomes in terms of the justice system with this issue. Um, yeah, again, talking about gaps, that's huge. Um, and I just wanted to clarify as well, I'm only sort of representing my own area, which is kind of the strictly justice area of Kwanlin Dunn, but there is a lot of good work being done by Kwanlin Dunn in health, education, um, other areas that are really important to this issue as well. Um, but in terms of the justice system and like the criminal code and system, we, indigenous, I'm talking about indigenous people really didn't have much of a role in forming that system. And that is incredibly clear because of its, I think, focus on in the individual, on individual rights um, and obligations. So when somebody is criminalized for breaking a law, um, we look at punishing that, that person. And I think a lot of the time we don't look back and say, is this a symptom of our society? How are we collectively contributing to this? And um, where's some of our own collective responsibility? Um, for Indigenous people often, um, it was more community-based um, and the solutions to deviancy were more community-based. And um, I think, uh, I, I mean, I don't wanna be um, ge too general, but um, taking some responsibility for that person. And then when you live in a small community in like a Yukon First Nation community like Old Crow, McIntyre, um, you know everybody and you know their life story and you know what they've been through. Um, but from a First Nation perspective now, like from a government perspective, there are a lot of barriers for us getting involved in that person's life. Um, for example, if somebody is incarcerated, um, there's privacy laws, there's um, their individual rights um, that 
prevents us from going in and getting information on them or going in and intervening and offering services because that is out of our, our realm. Um, they have to consent to that. Um, they might not want us involved, um, even if we're there to help. Um, there are barriers all along the way for the First Nation getting involved. Um, so it would take a lot of reform in that system for us to um, begin to um, change, like build a system that is more conducive to healing. We, we don't see people going to jail very often and coming out healed. Um, and then it's expected that they are released back into the community. Um, and Kate Quanlin Dunn has right now a huge focus on community safety. So that is not gonna really work if, if um, we may not want them released to the community if it's going to harm vulnerable people, children, um, if it's gonna put anyone in danger or make them feel unsafe. Um, because community safety right now is the most important thing. Prevention of crime is a, the most important thing. Um, the reintegration of somebody coming out of WCC is probably secondary. I don't wanna like overstep what I'm saying, but um, really the safety of children and families is, is more important right now. And it's not, we would love to do more reintegration work, but we just don't have the resources right now. And we also don't have um, the influence over corrections um, or probation or that, that like to the level that we would need um, in order to safely do that in a good way. So um, yeah, there's just so many <laughs> gaps in the system, but um, yeah, we are working on, for, for instance, strengthening um, some of uh, KDFN's um, approaches to justice that might be more in line with the culture and the value system of that First Nation. So um, we are doing an indigenous law research project over three years with the community where we um, analyze stor stories using a legal analysis method, um, bring up principles, values of the community, uh, work, go, go to people, like go to homes, go to camps, um, do this work with them um, wherever they're comfortable. And um, that's just one step towards um, really strengthening that community core. And then hopefully um, that will kind of go into programming and including on the land and more, uh, for lack of a better word, like restorative, um, processes to try and reduce incarceration, to try and improve healing outcomes um, and uh, keeping the community sort of harmonious as possible. So, yeah. I'm good? Okay. <laughs> Um, yeah, I really appreciate that. It's a fascinating discussion. Um, I, I know there are, and, and when I was thinking of that gap question, I know there have been, there's significant gap, and, and I think people have highlighted what I can maybe term the human health resource crisis as well. Um, and I know certainly the agency I work for has been, uh, has experienced that as well. But I've also, I just wanted to highlight, I, I feel like we've had some really good ability to make change even within that, um, you know, highlighting what you said, Inspector Ellis, around what we've done with the partnership with RCMP and MWC right now. And I think really just um, focusing, I remember focusing sort of like the, the issue we have with the, with, the, with the client, with the person, with the human in front of us is still going to exist if we don't do this. Bronte, I know, and our partnership exploded over last year when we sat down together. And Bronte and I got very lucky. We got to be part of actually... Um, I would say that sort of the pragmatic part of a supervised consumption site, both of us knowing we need a supervised consumption site. This is going to save lives. Oh my God, how are we going to do this? <laughs> and just not having that option almost to say we can't. Like if we don't, we're going to run into the same issue, I think. So I think even going back, taking from this and taking from uh, the conversations that have happened over the course of the last two days around um, feedback and taking feedback. I think there was sort of that idea that we take feedback as people, but we also take feedback as agencies. And I think really going back and looking at the, the system that I work with and saying, okay, how are we 
creating barriers to making these. And I, I think that's, um, I just appreciate what you're saying. I think that's a huge component of it. Um, see if I can mess with this question. Um, this is sort of, sorry, this is a bit counselory of me, but this is sort of like a question we like to ask. It's a bit of the magic wand question. But if you were able to look into the future, what specific outcomes and changes would you like to see? Sort of that magic wand, how could you see, what would you, intervention would you have in a very wishful and positive way of making change in your community or, or our community? Um, <laughs> my turn. <laughs> Pause <Yeah>. afterwards. <laughs> Um, I think to sort of wrap up everything that has also been said from um, from everyone at the table and, and even Cameron, um, it, it's I think for us as as an organization, it's uh, it's education and knowledge, and like Cameron said too, it's education and knowledge for our organization internally um, as well as as the community. Um, so. Um, some of you may be aware um, that we have a uh, an official partnership with Council Yukon First Nations, um, which assists us in in so many ways. Um, and and the biggest uh, I think the biggest thing for us as an organization um, is ensuring that we're being as culturally informed um, at all times and with the changes and, and growths within the Yukon and the Yukon First Nations, um, as well as the supports that are are provided for the service users, um, and then also the the education piece and, and being able to make space and changing perspectives as a community about you know everything that is is happening for the individuals that we're serving and all the work and good work that goes behind the scenes um, and I know you know Aaron also mentioned the, the colonization and the, the trauma that comes with that and the overrepresentation of indigenous peoples within many of our services and within the justice system healthcare system um, so really being aware of you know, the traumatic experiences that people have faced and, and again, what Bronte touched on, you know, the reasons behind um, the use of substances, whether drugs or alcohol, and then also the, the continuous um, criminal behavior or the cycle, the, the cycle of criminal behavior for survival. Um, and, you know, our, our goal is ultimately to reduce um, individuals going back into being incarcerated, but we still have all of these um, gaps that we're working towards to filling. Um, so I guess I, I think patience, compassion, empathy, um, and understanding where folks are coming from and all the work that goes behind supporting the individuals to get to a place where they feel worthy, they feel safe, they feel, um, you know, they, they're, they're starting to bring back their own, um, you know, dignity, self-respect, um, self-esteem, and, um, and, you know, it's really hard. All of us have our own core values, and to to think about losing any of our core values um, really is it's heartbreaking to to think of losing your dignity, respect, your trust, um, honesty, and and I think as a community, if we can um, look at the person as a whole, look at the the community as a whole, and work together to to create space to. Um, allow healing is sort of what I would like to see um, personally um, and also as an organization and, and give that space for all of us to be able to continue doing the work that we do. Um, and that's educating, educating ourselves continuously and educating um, the community and answering questions and things like this, being able to have opportunities like this. I'll pass that on to uh, Lindsay. How do I follow that? I don't know. I thought that was beautiful. Thank you, Gigi. Um, fully agree. I think that as everybody uh, up here has said, you know, uh, community-led, culturally informed, culturally-led um, health starts from that level. Um, it can't be implemented unless it's from that sort of collaboration and education and supportive, um, supportive way, a way of being. Um, specific outcomes I would like to see. Um, you know, it, it would be really nice to not have any calls for service at Whitehorse Detachment tonight. That would be a measure of health of a community. 
that's not going to happen. I can say that. I don't think it hasn't hap has happened in many, many, many years. Um, but you know, when we're looking down the road, that that would be my dream. Um, my dream would be to see you know uh, some of the things that are going on in McIntyre about a healthy community um, being ruled out everywhere else in the Yukon um, and understanding the capacity around that. Um, but, you know, there are some, I think, really nimble, quick things that maybe could be looked at to help support some of those things. And, you know, they're not just Band-Aids, but they're, you know, returning it back to what the root cause of some of the issues are. Um, so, you know, I'm very interested, and I think we as the RCMP are very interested in um, not only safe supply, um, but safe supply of alcohol and managed alcohol programs. Um, I think that a lot of the folks that we deal with it is an absolute health need uh, to consume alcohol and some of the things that, that and the behavior that comes out of that and the interaction with the justice system, that can be, um, if, if willing, um, that can be really mitigated. Um, and also, you know, some of the, um, the really terrible outcomes that can come of that, and we do see that as well, um, you know, um, the morbidity rate could go down around around some of those alcohol-related um, incidents. Um, supportive housing that's you know tailored to meet specific needs that's a pipe dream too, um, and that's we're getting there. I think as a community, we're really getting there, um, and also with not only the complex needs but the cultural needs, and uh, everybody else has spoken about that as well. Um, and, you know, just health of every community in the, in the Yukon. That's, that's the specific outcomes that I would like to see. Okay. Well, it's hard to follow all of that. Uh, am I on? No. <laughs> <laughs> okay, now I am. Um, so, I mean, a lot of what Gigi and Lindsay have already said um, in terms of, I think, meeting people um, with dignity and respect and empathy, uh, seeing a community that can look at an individual not for the fact that, you know, they may be struggling right now, but them as a whole human being who has meaning and worth uh, and value to their community and, and, and is loved, and um, acknowledging it from that perspective. I think uh, that people who use drugs in our community are treated with dignity and respect, and that they have access to the health services and supports that they need um, along a spectrum from having access to uh, safe supply, freedom from criminalization, and also access to uh, treatment programs that are um, responsive to their needs that, uh, that have a variety of options to them, um, and finding uh, options for um, for people along a housing spectrum as well. So from supportive housing to also meeting people who we know in our community right now are struggling to access private market. Um, so that people um, are well and housed and um, have uh, their needs met in our community. Uh, their their you know their their cultural needs, their spiritual needs, um, their basic needs like uh, food security, um, health, and housing. That um, those we have avenues from for meeting those needs, and, and we don't see people in our community who who are struggling and who are falling through all of the gaps that we've all discussed today. Um, I think really comes from a core point of acknowledging that, um, that the stigma that exists around substance use and that um, a person who uses drugs is, is a, a, a member of our community, a valued member of our community, and that does not diminish their value in any way. Um, and they need uh, access to the health supports that they need. And just, um, I think, acknowledging, as we've all discussed, the context in which someone, what might bring someone to, to to be involved with the justice system or to need support with substance use, um, we have to address those underlying causes. We have to address um, colonization, people's experience with residential schools, people's experience with trauma, um, the ways in which our current system continues to re, um, reoccur these, these issues and, and still continues to engage in a, in a process of colonization. Um, those, those gaps need to be addressed as well if we're going to move forward into a, a healthier society as a whole. Um, if I had a magic wand, um, I'd want to see every Yukon First Nation kid just grow up with access to education in their language, 
to be able to learn about their own culture and people, um, to be on the land, to hunt and just be so happy and proud of who they are. Um, and I would not want us to have a criminal justice system. I think we, uh, to, we would only need it in certain situations. That would be my hope. Um, incarceration, there'd be almost no one incarcerated. Um, and um, we'd have a mass uh, reallocation of resources to education, to health, to um, housing, to making sure people get their needs met so that they can be happy and healthy and feel free. That would, that would be what I would want. <laughs> Thank you. I just want to say thank you to all our panelists. I found this fascinating as well. Like uh, my sort of my training is in forensics, but I work in health. I'm starting to feel like connected a little bit. But um, we have some gifts for you. I should have said this a long time ago. The size of gift you receive is not directly correlated to the impact of this, what you provided. But <laughs> Inspector Ellis. Um, so actually, well, we have a few minutes, uh, a couple minutes, but there's a couple questions, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, no, sorry, I was just going to say, I can repeat your question or you'll get a microphone. <laughs> I was actually doing that behind you. <laughs> I am, I swear, the power of this microphone is going to my head after three days. I'm really... <laughs> okay, when a person comes to your organization and um, say they brought a gram of um, something and you tested it, and it has fentanyl in it. So what happens from there? That's a, sorry, that's a great question. Um, so what we're seeing actually in our community is that and pretty much any opiate that you can purchase here is fentanyl. So if you're someone that uses um, an opiate, uh, you previously maybe used heroin, um, you're going to be buying fentanyl. Um, people who use opiates in our community use fentanyl, and so they're often seeking fentanyl. Um, sometimes we see instances where someone is looking to confirm that their substance is fentanyl because that's what they're seeking. So we've, we, because of the way that the overdose crisis has changed and the integration of fentanyl into our opioid supply, um, the way that we manage fentanyl has had to change too because we're not just looking at it as a contamination of their drug. Oftentimes we're looking at it as something they actually are consuming on a regular basis. So if a drug tests positive for fentanyl, it may depend on um, whether or not that's the user's intended drug or not. So somebody might be, and what their response is. Someone might say to us, this is what I wanted, um, and then we're gonna talk to them about what are some safer ways they can consume this substance. So that would be using our supervised consumption site. Um, often people are testing their drugs before they consume on site so that we are there and we can respond if there is an overdose testing a small amount first, so using like a quarter of their dose that they would normally use, uh, making sure that they're around other people if they choose not to use the supervised consumption site or don't have access to it, um, making sure that they have an naloxone kit and that the person around them knows how to use it. Um, if they can't do any of those things, using the national overdose response line so that someone's on the phone to call um, if, they, if they were to overdose. So those are some of the things we might talk to someone who's intentionally or, or wants to keep a substance that contains fentanyl. We also have a FTIR spectrometer um, at our supervised consumption site, which allows us to know a little bit more about what that drug is and can give us a bit of a range of how high the concentration in fentanyl is in a substance. So the conversation may also depend based on that and what that person who uses drugs experiences using fentanyl um, currently. So do they use it every day or is this something they've never used before? Because if they use it every day, they likely have a tolerance and they may have a, an understanding of that drug. But if they've never used it before, that's a much um, 
that, that, that could be a much more dangerous uh, substance for them to have. And we want to really make sure that they're informed and knowledgeable about what the substance is that they have with them. Um, if we're finding fentanyl and it's a drug that the person was not intending, so they're bringing us cocaine and we're seeing fentanyl in it, which isn't uh, anywhere near as frequent as we're seeing fentanyl in the opiate supply, but if we do find that, um, we're going to have a conversation with them. This is what fentanyl is. This is what it does. These are the risks that are involved. This is how it might interplay if there are other drugs involved. So if the spectrometer says, yes, cocaine is also present, this is what reaction your body might have to this substance. Uh, so that they, we can inform that person about what is the potential risk here, acknowledging that anytime someone uses a substance, there is a risk involved, but they can make an informed decision now. And if they choose that they don't want to keep that drug, that, then we will take it to uh, Lindsay uh, at the ICMP, well, not Lindsay specifically, but in <laughs> your office, um, and have it destroyed, uh, surrender it. Um, and that's an option that we offer to everyone who, for any substance that they may want to have surrendered. Um, but they also have the option of still consuming that drug. Uh, but we're going to give them a lot of information about how to prevent overdose um, and really encourage them to use at the supervised consumption site. Uh, use around others and use the National Overdose Response Line.